Let's do this. All right, welcome back, everybody. We're in the last week. Uh, this is a lecture I'm very excited about because we get to take all of the amazing things you've learned in the previous nine weeks and put them in one model. Well, not one model, but a few models. Uh, and we'll do some very useful things with all the Bayesian machinery. Uh, let me start with a data story. Uh, now I'm, I'm hesitant, as always, to bring up American politics just because it, you know, well, just because. <laughs> uh, but this is an abstract and really interesting example of a general phenomenon that doesn't all, only apply to American politics. There's a lot going on in this graph, but let me help you understand what's going on. Uh, what you're seeing on the horizontal is the birth year of voters. It's the year they're born in. So it's like age, right, but set to some Roman calendar, right? And uh, on the vertical, we have the Republican vote share of individuals in that birth year. And so you, you, it's, you can't go from this graph to who won the election because you have to deal with, there's no voter turnout and there's no age distribution of the population. It's at each specific birth year, what for people of that birth year, what was the share of their vote that they gave to the Republican presidential candidate in different years. And so as, as uh, you may know, every four years, there's this international event, an American president is elected, right? And uh, there's a big betting pool that goes on all the time. And so each of the colors here is a different election year, uh, 2000, 2004, 2008, and then 2012 in blue. And as you get closer to the present, uh, younger people are allowed to vote. Well, not that they're younger, it's that people born in more recent years are allowed to vote, right? So that you'll see that these curves are shifting to the left, right, as a consequence of that, because people are becoming 18, and 18 is the legal age to vote in the United States. Um, nevertheless, if you plot it, so if you plotted this graph by age, you wouldn't see the phenomenon that you see in this view. And in this view, you see an interesting phenomenon is that uh, the, cur the hills and valleys of these curves across elections line up, even though um, in any particular year, it can move up and down quite a lot. So 2008 was an election some people will remember here. There was a certain candidate who was historical and <laughs> different, and it was a big movement election in the US. Um, and so you get, uh, it's much lower down. There was much less Republican vote share in all age groups that year as a consequence. Nevertheless, the peaks and valleys are in the same place. Uh, what does this mean? It means that there are what we call cohort effects in the American electorate. Something special about the year you're born in sets the average political preferences for life, it seems, because these things aren't changing, right? So what's going on? Of course, it's not the year you're born in. It's something that happens to people born in the same year at some point in their life, probably not their birth year, because if you've been around a baby lately, Anybody? Right? They're not very aware of politics. Yeah, so it's probably not getting political ideology in year of birth, right? They're not paying attention. It's something that happens later. And uh, th this is scratched from a cool paper from 2014 um, by Gitza and Gelman, where they uh, fit a big hierarchical Bayesian model to this to figure out what age it is that is setting people's lifetime political orientation. And uh, the robust explanation seems to be what matters is when you get near 18 or turn 18, who is president, what party is that person from, and are they popular? Uh, and from that, you can predict, predict an age cohort's political orientation, at least in the United States, for the rest of their lives. And so there's this weird effect, right? Looking again on the, on, uh, on the left, on the right, you're seeing this what they've done is they fit a parameter for every age group uh, to see the weight of the popularity of the president when you're that age and how that predicts your political behavior. And you'll see there's this spike around 18. It's not perfectly 18, though, because some people become politically aware earlier. Some people become politically aware later because they don't vote until they're 23 or something like that, right? It happens very often in the US, actually. 18-year-olds don't vote at very high rates. Um, uh, so there's this general curve, but 18 is a very special age because it's when you become legally uh, able. And then things that happen when you're older don't have nearly as much of an effect. Um, age is a predictor variable. You've used it in models before, uh, but it, its effect is not necessarily linear. It's like a category, the year you're born in. 
but it has similarity to joining categories. If uh, 18 is sim more similar to 19 and 17 than it is to 25. Uh, so it's an ordered category where every particular member of this category can have its own quantitative effect. And if we want to take effects like this seriously, because they exist, then we need to have statistical machinery to do this, to deal with what I'm going to call continuous categories. Uh, so in this case, uh, I love this example, uh, help you understand. So if you look at 1950 on the left graph, there's this trough. Um, why? That's the Nixon effect, right? So Americans born around 1950 are less conservatives than Americans my age, which is the 1970 cohort, right? Winona Ryder, right? Because when you see me, you see Winona Ryder. It's like for the same generation. <laughs> Nobody's like, no, I don't see Winona Ryder when I look at you. <laughs> so that's fair. But uh, uh, it's that generation, right? The Reality Bites generation, if anybody knows that movie. And um, uh, my generation is the most conservative American generation. That's the Reagan effect. When we became a political age, Reagan was president and he was winning the Cold War. Remember there was a wall <laughs> and all this other stuff, right? Tear down that wall and all these other things. And I'm, I don't mean to give him credit for all that. It's just in the American imagination. Reagan gets credit for everything. And so if you turned 18 around that time, right, uh, there's this whole narrative that plays out. And so uh, I'm sorry to say, as, as my generation ages into political power, the U.S. is probably going to get more conservative um, as a consequence of this. Anyway, uh, uh, it's a very cool statistical effect how you uncover it. So uh, continuous categories uh, like age are everywhere in data sets. You can assert that they have linear effects, but then you're immediately giving up on a bunch of these non-monotonic sorts of cohort effects that can arise. Um, or any number of other interesting things in data sets. So uh, income can work like this. Uh, there's, there's no reason that every additional uh, uh, percent of income should have the same quantitative effect. Nevertheless, if income values that are similar to one another probably have similar effects. So it's an ordered category, but it's continuous, right? Just like age. Uh, location. How is location a category? Well, it's a proxy for stuff you haven't measured. Plants or animals that are near one another are exposed to common confounds that we haven't measured, and so location is a proxy for those things, for common exposures that we haven't, haven't uh, seen. Uh, phylogenetic distance, uh, very analogous to location. Phylogeny is a proxy for unmeasured things that make closely related species similar to one another. Um, social network distance, lots of other things. You can, you can invent <coughs> continuous categories all day long if you think about it for very long. So there's no, there are no obvious cut points, uh, but the idea is that similar values are, well, similar in their effects. So if we're going to do this, uh, if you want to have an infinite number of categories, you probably want to use some pooling. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make models today where there are an infinite number of categories, it's continuous, and we'll fit arbitrarily shaped functions, like that age curve you saw on the previous slide, but we'll do so with pooling, and it'll work great. And this is uh, a very common process in machine learning called Gaussian process regression, which is not a very helpful term, I admit. It doesn't tell you anything about what's going on, except it, the word Gaussian probably gives you a clue that there's going to be a normal distribution somewhere in here. Um, there will, a very, very big one, uh, in fact. So let me uh, spend the rest of the day showing you two examples with code of how to do this. And the first one is going to be dealing with spatial autocorrelation, which is an incredibly common uh, phenomenon. Whether you're a biologist or a social scientist, this is a routine issue where shared space uh, uh, is a proxy for unmeasured confounds that you might want to deal with. Um, so let's go back to the Oceanic Societies uh, example from earlier in the course and think about um, uh, spatial autocorrelation in this data set. So to remind you, we were interested in predicting the number of tools on each island as a function of its population size, because there's this cultural evolutionary model uh, that leads us to believe that larger populations have more tools, but that they're also diminishing returns on that. Uh, one of the problems here is that islands that are near one another can get their tools from their neighbors and invent them. Uh, uh, oceanic societies were not isolated. They're on islands, but they're very good sailors. <laughs> and so to, to say that oceanic societies are isolated from one another is just wrong. We just know that that's wrong. Maybe Hawaii. Okay, Hawaii was by itself. But, uh, I mean, they brought a lot of tools with them, though. So there's still an effect of the contact. 
but certainly when you down in uh, near Tonga and all the others, there's tremendous historical contact and flow of, of even political systems uh, around. So um, distance between islands is a proxy for contact. It may be better than that dummy coated high and low contact that I had before. And so can we use that? Can we think of it that way? And we can. We'll do this as a Gaussian process regression. Um, here's the idea. You construct a distance matrix. It's just a big matrix shown here in the bottom of this slide of all the pairwise distances here in thousands of kilometers between the different island systems. Right? Uh, we could probably do better than this if we did some real GIS stuff and thought about sailing distance. Right? So this is as, as an airplane flies distance. I got these distances from uh, airline routes, <laughs> like how you would do it. So just great circles from island to island. As the crow flies, but I would say, but no crow can fly this far. Right? <laughs> they would collapse in the ocean at some point. So, um, so if we knew something about actual sailing routes and trade winds, we could probably do better than this. Uh, but this is this will suffice to give you an idea how the method works. Um, so you'll notice along the diagonal, it's all zeros, and that's because every island is exactly on top of itself. Yeah. So that's what the diagonal is. And then off diagonals, this is a symmetric matrix, so the upper triangle is the same as the lower triangle. Um, you have distances in uh, thousands of kilometers between the two. So this is like our map of confound threats. Uh, what could make the tool count similar, uh, correlated between islands that are closer together. Uh, there'll be more movement. So. Um, Let's build this uh, matrix into the model. So just to remind you, this is the model we we're going to use. This is the, what I call the scientific tools model, right? We're going to use this one because it's way better than the other one, right? Uh, to remind you how this works, we've got the expected number of tools, lambda, um, that's going to be linked to the actual outcome, T sub i, the measured historical number of tools on that in that society. And there was this dynamic model, which gave us an equilibrium prediction. Uh, shown here is the definition of lambda, or alpha is some proportionality constant, that is the innovations of tools you get from each person uh, in the population. Uh, and that's what P sub i is, the population size. Beta is this elasticity, or it's your diminishing returns rate on population. Um, and gamma is the loss rate uh, of tools, because tools fall out of use, uh, they're forgotten, and the more tools you have, the, the more you lose. So we can get the Gaussian process into this model by adding a factor on the front of it. So uh, I'll walk you through this. Um, I've added this exponent e to the k society. k sub society is like a varying intercept. Right? It's a parameter that's going to be estimated for each society specifically. Um, it's going to have a normal prior, the so normal distribution. When we exponentiate it, it's positive. And that's why it's exponentiated. It's got to be positive because lambda's got to be positive. So this becomes a factor. Uh, the way you think about how this works is when k is 0, e to the 0 is 1. And this means exactly as expected by the model. Right? So if an island gets k equals 0, that means it's just the, the model prediction. It, the, it isn't in, inflated or deflated at all. If, it's, if k is negative, uh, you exponentiate this, you get a number less than 1. So for example, e to the minus 0.5 is about 0.6. And that means 60% of the expected number of tools. So you see this factor on the front is, is decreasing or increasing or leaving the same, the expectation uh, from the other parameters. And we're going to fit this using this matrix of all the islands. This is going to be the, is going to hold our correlated effects. And so some of the islands are going to get inflated because they're near islands with lots of tools. Uh, and others are going to get deflated. And those inflations and deflations will be stored in K. Does this make some sense? If you had a linear model, you wouldn't do the exponentiation. You'd just stick the k on there. Yeah? OK. So now the fun part, the Gaussian process part. Where do we get these k's from? And the answer is from a big matrix, a 10 by 10 uh, normal distribution. This is the Gaussian part of Gaussian process. Um, you have this big prior that has all of these varying effects, varying factors in it. So there's a big vector of all the k's. There are 10 of them here because there are 10 island societies in the data set. Remember, it's a small data set. Good to teach with. Yeah. Um, and these all come from the same multivariate normal prior, just like the things we worked with last week for varying slopes. Now we have a 10 by 10 covariance matrix k, 
Yeah? You with me? Uh, and how do you build this thing? That sounds bad, right? A 10 by 10 matrix. Won't that be a lot of parameters? No. It will have a very small number of parameters, and we're going to generate the whole matrix from that distance matrix that we had before. We're going to use it to parameterize how the correlation falls off at distance. And there are lots of ways you can do this. In particular, I'm going to show you the most common one, uh, which is this, this so-called L2 norm uh, equation shown at the bottom of this slide, where each cell in the matrix K, uh, uh, so Kij, which is a cell on for the, where the ice island and the jth island meet, right? What's the covariance between those two islands? That's Kij is given by this expression, which I'll walk you through on the next slide. Uh, but what I want you to see about this is it only has um, uh, three parameters in it. And I'll explain them to you on the next slide. It, so you could have a 300 by 300 matrix, uh, which we can have by the end of the day, actually. I'll show you one. Uh, and it'll still only have three parameters in it. But you get the whole covariance matrix from it, and it's generated from this distance matrix. Um, so this is what this L2 norm uh, covariance matrix uh, means. So on the left, we've got the covariance between islands I and J. Say that's Tonga and Hawaii. Uh, this eta squared thing on the front is the maximum covariance between any two islands. And we're going to fit that from the data. And then this is multiplied by this weird looking thing in the middle. This is E to the minus rho squared dij squared. So I'll take this one piece at a time. Rho squared is a rate of decline with distance. We're going to fit that from the data too. And d squared is the square distance between islands i and j. It comes from that matrix that we feed in as data. Does it make sense? So this is the Gaussian part of this, actually. It's not, the, uh, it's not the normal distribution. This is the Gaussian part, because this is uh, a bell curve. You may know that you get a Gaussian distribution by doing e to the minus something squared, <laughs> uh, some squared uh, factor. That's what gives you the bell curve shape uh, in the Gaussian. And so this gives you this uh, Gaussian fall off with distance. The last bit on this is often called jigger in the literature, this uh, delta ij sigma squared. Delta ij is a very special function. Uh, it's like an identity function. If, if i and j are equal, delta ij is 1. If i and j are different, delta ij is 0. And all it does is it turns sigma squared on and off. And what is sigma squared? It's the additional variance of an island with itself. So if you've got multiple observations of a single island, you need this factor there so that they've got all predicted to be the same. Right? It, it makes the matrix positive definite. Um, we're not going to need that here because we only have one observation per island. So let me show you uh, the, the working bit of this uh, function in the middle and the shape it generates. Um, this generates this Gaussian decline or the squared distance. So that's what I show you in this plot, the solid curve. Uh, so the horizontal axis on this plot is distance between two islands in thousands of kilometers. Yeah. And the vertical is the correlation. I've standardized this, uh, the correlation. Um, and I've just made up some values uh, for rho to show you the example. And if you use the square distance uh, function like the one on this slide, you get that solid curve where it starts out initially with a very slow decline. So islands that are really close to one another can have a high correlation. It doesn't have to be one. You can set that wherever you want, but the shape will still be the same. And then it accelerates like a Gaussian curve does as you move away from the mean. This is like half of a Gaussian distribution. Do you see that? Yeah, the familiar bell curve. Um, and what you end up with then is this accelerating uh, rate means that you, you get to the flat part of the tail really fast and uh, you can get a, a very sharp decline but with distance. If you choose a linear distance instead, so say you take the function at the top and you take the square off the d, so it's not d squared anymore but just d, just the distance, the absolute value, uh, distance between two islands, then you get the dashed linear curve and there's nothing wrong with that. You could use that model. Um, but it has a different set of assumptions in it, right? It assumes that the, the rate of loss of covariance is fastest at the start, right? Well, it's the same everywhere, actually, but it's a, effectively the amount you lose is, is largest at the beginning, um, which I assert is usually not the case uh, in things. That's usually not how it goes. Usually you get out of some radius of common exposure and then it declines. But this is a scientific question and you're free to do uh, all kinds of things here as the science requires. The L2 norm is the most common. Um, okay, 
let's put it all together into one terrifyingly large model. I, I put pictures of beautiful island paradises on all these slides to <laughs> soothe you during this lesson. Um, I want to remind you though, really all we're doing to make a Gaussian process, it's all in the prior. These are varying effects models where the varying effects are drawn from one giant Gaussian distribution, which has some distance matrix inside of it. And that's all they are. The rest of the structure of the model is everything you've seen before. They're just GLMs. Uh, but it's the prior that's doing all the work and creates the continuous category. And so this can be here, it's distance, but we could do ages too. You could have all the pairwise differences in ages between all the individuals in a population. And then all of their particular effects for every individual would be a random effect and be drawn from this giant Gaussian distribution with a big covariance matrix. Yeah, with three parameters inside of it. Yeah, and that's like the Gelman paper. <laughs> that's how you do these things. Uh, so here's the model. Uh, very quickly, starting from the top, the Poisson, then um, lambda with the k's inside of it as a multiplicative factor. Then comes um, all of our vector of k's is this multivariate normal. The action is in defining the covariance matrix capital K, which is the next line, and then you've got some priors. Down at the bottom, we have to design, uh, define priors for eta squared and rho squared. The first thing you're going to ask is, why are these things squared? They don't have to be. So this is the convention, and I want you to learn the conventions. Um, so, you know, I, I think in some Boer paper, they were squared so they'd be positive, and you could put other things on them. Uh, we don't need to fight with those uh, issues here, but I want to stick with the conventions. The important thing is you can just define eta squared and rho squared on the squared scale in your model, and that's perfectly fine, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, uh, but we want to simulate from these priors and show you what this prior implies. Same business. What does it mean to assign exponential 2 and exponential 0.5 to these things? What kind of covariance functions does that imply? How do you figure that out? You simulate. So, of course, in the text, I give you the code to generate this plot. Uh, it works exactly as you might imagine. You just sample some random exponentials for eta squared and rho squared using the means that I had uh, here on the slide, right? Random exponential with a mean of two, random exponential, well, it's not a mean of two, with a lambda of two, right? So remember the mean of an exponential is one over its rate. So if, the, if lambda is two, the mean of that distribution is a half, and the mean of the other one is two. Yeah, it's an inverse. The rate is the inverse of the mean in an exponential. Um, so we sample random vectors from both of these and then we plug it into that kij function, right? And we get a covariance that declines with distance. And we can then plot that out. We vary the distance and we draw a curve. And that's what you see here. Um, and I, I think this is like 50 samples uh, from the prior distribution, distance at thousands of kilometers on the horizontal axis, and then some random covariances from the prior. And you can see that in this prior, most of them fall off very rapidly. So the prior assumes that Distance effects are, are, well, they could be anything uh, very close from very small uh, uh, to reasonable. Two is actually not so strong on this scale, uh, but they could be moderately strong to absolutely incredibly weak down near the bottom, but all of them drop off pretty fast. So this prior says, eh, there's probably not much contamination, uh, but this is a very weak prior. You'll see the posterior is going to look really different uh, from this. Um, how do we code this model? Uh, well, as you might expect, the only thing that's really going to change is that you've got to stick this Gaussian process thing in there. And to make computing uh, that covariance matrix easier, there's this helper function in Oolong uh, that you'll see in the middle of the slide here. I'll highlight it in a second. Um, the first thing is, of course, we've got these k's for each society. And those come from, a, uh, there's a vector of length 10 of them. Right? There's one for each island. So this is just like a varying intercept vector, just like the sort of things you've seen before. These come, they come from this multinormal distribution with um, a covariance matrix sigma. And sigma is a 10 by 10 matrix. And then there's this helper function, uh, covariance GPL2. What does that mean? Well, we're, we're computing a covariance matrix. And GPL2 is Gaussian process L2 norm. Right, that means it uses the Gaussian kernel, as it's called. Um, all this does is do some loops to do that formula that was on the previous uh, slides, right? That Kij formula. This is all it does. It's just a function that does a couple loops to calculate that. You could write that yourself, actually, inside Ulam if you wanted with four loops, but that would be maddening, right? So this is just a helper function to save you some time. But if you look at the stand code for this model, you'll see there's just a loop that is calculating uh, every trajectory, right? Every leapfrog step 
it calculates this matrix again and takes its derivatives. Right? And that's how it does the Hamiltonian trajectories in this thing. Uh, it's a lot of derivatives, I know, but Stan can do it. So uh, the action inside this thing, what do you have to give it? You have to give it a distance matrix, which here I've called DMAT. That's the matrix I showed you before that I got from an online airline database of the distances between different oceanic islands and in thousands of kilometers. And then eta squared and rho squared, just parameters. Um, and then the point zero 0.01 on the end is that sigma squared jigger term, which does nothing in this model because we don't have repeat observations on the same things. But it, it can't be zero. It's got to be a little, little, uh, a little bit above zero. But we don't fit it from the data because we don't have any data here to, fit it, to estimate it from the data. And then uh, the priors uh, on the bottom that we had on the previous slides. Good? You're indulging it? Yeah? Okay, what happens? Cool stuff happens. Uh, this sample's no problem, even, uh, right? A 10 by 10 matrix, you know you're not afraid of those anymore. You've done way bigger matrices, yeah. Or definitely by the end of today we will. And um, when you look at the Precy output for this, this is wholly uninterpretable. <laughs> this, this, just a bunch of, this is the tide prediction engine all over again. There's no way you can understand very much from this. You could read this, the uh, uh, effect of population size still, the, the uh, uh, A, B, and G's down here in some crude way, but remember the scientific model, this, none of those is like a slope, so you still need the plot predictions. Um, so we want to uh, plot things instead. Same thing as always, how do you understand a model? You push uh, the posterior back through it and you get uh, predictions or retrodictions, uh, as it were, of the sample. But you can understand is that these K values uh, they're like on the log scale. They're exponentiated inside the predictor part of the model. And so if you think about any island that's got a zero, like uh, island number two here. Sorry, I forgot what island number two is. But, uh, island number two, that is exactly as the model expected. If it's a negative, then that was being drugged down by some neighbor. Uh, and if it's higher, uh, bigger than zero, it's being drugged up by some neighbor, away from the expectation of the model otherwise. Does that make sense? Um, and then eta squared and rho squared at the bottom are completely uninterpretable for reasons that I will spend some time on now. Okay, but we want to plot those to get some idea of the posterior covariance that's happening here. So again, at the top to remind you, this is what this GPL2 function is. It's this, this Gaussian kernel covariance function. And on the left, I'm repeating the prior for you to show you the prior and on the right, um, uh, 50 uh, samples from the posterior distribution to show you the posterior ones. Uh, uh, relatively small on the raw covariance scale, um, but declines more slowly than the prior did on average. So there are some long distance effects of moderate covariance dragging the tool counts around. Uh, you can't, so I, I show you here the two lines from the Precy output on the slide two for eta squared and rho squared. There's no way you can look at that 0.18 and 1.39 and figure out these shapes uh, for a very good reason uh, because these two parameters are really strongly correlated in the posterior because right? they multiply in a really complicated way inside this function at the top of the slide right so they're not totally independent in their action you can make one bigger and the other smaller at the same time and get the same covariance function almost and so, if, for example, I show you here now on the left of this slide, I'm just plotting the posterior distribution of eta squared on the horizontal against the posterior distribution of rho squared on the vertical. These are just samples uh, from the Markov chain. And you'll see this is, this is what our non-independence looks like uh, for zero bounded parameters, right? So what's happening? As you go to the right uh, on this, um, rho squared gets smaller, right? If you make eta squared big, rho squared gets smaller. And if you make rho squared smaller, eta squared gets bigger on average. That's a negative correlation. So this is the fact that you can get very similar covariance matrices by making one of these big and the other small. So you can't interpret them independently of one another in the Precy output. This is useless. All right, you've got to push them back through. Now, I know I've been telling you this sermon about ordinary regression coefficients for, the, for weeks now, and so I hope I've convinced you of this. But reading, trying to read how a model behaves by looking at each parameter by itself is folly. It just does not work. Um, Okay, we want to understand this model now. Uh, we don't really care about those covariance functions in and of themselves, although we can learn from this, right? That, that gives us an expectation of how uh, contact networks, how far they extend for certain pairs of islands. Uh, 
But we can think about this on the outcome scale by computing the implied correlations among the islands and then putting them on a map. So let's do that now. So we take the posterior distribution of the covariance matrices, those covariance functions that were on the previous slide, and then we can compute for each pair of islands the posterior mean correlation right, between them from that covariance function. How? Because we know their distance on the horizontal axis. So I go back to this slide, right? Their distance on the horizontal axis on the right-hand part of this slide for any pair of islands. And then at the posterior mean, we can compute their expected covariance. Yeah? And then we can standardize that to a correlation. And that's what this big matrix is. The code to do this is in the book. It's no more complicated than what I just described. You just compute that uh, KIJ function for each pair of islands at the posterior mean. Um, and you get this big thing. And now this is a correlation matrix, so the diagonal is all ones, because every island is perfectly correlated with itself, right? And then the off diagonals in the symmetric matrix are the expected correlations and tool counts uh, uh, due to the location effects. So if you look at the far right column or the bottom row, that's Hawaii, or excuse me, Hawaii, or something like that. <laughs> Sorry, no, that was horrible, but I'm trying. <laughs> so there's a glottal stop in that word. And uh, so if you're in Hawaii, um, you notice you've got zero correlation with everybody except yourself because Hawaii is really, I know it sounds stupid when I say it, right? <laughs> uh, Hawaii is really far away from everything else. It took the Polynesians forever to find it because it was off of all the trade winds and everything, right? They, they speed populated the rest of Oceania and then it took forever to find uh, Hawaii. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so uh, now what does this look like on a map? Uh, in this data set, I give you the latitude and longitude of these different islands. And so you can just use those to make a scatter plot of each island. And that's what I'm showing you here. Uh, lo longitude on the horizontal, of course, <laughs> latitude on the vertical. And uh, so this is like the world's uh, least high tech map of the Pacific Ocean that you're looking at, right? And um, the size of each point is the population size uh, of that island. Right? So Hawaii is the biggest point because Hawaii had an order of magnitude more population at European contact than all the other islands, societies in Oceania. Uh, and then the line segments connecting these are shaded with intensity proportional to that correlation in the matrix we just calculated. So you're seeing that, yeah, islands near one another have stronger correlations. So there's this triad down there, right, Santa Cruz, uh, Decopia, and Malekula, which have very uh, strong correlations, they're get, there's this gravity effect. There are lots of trade and historical contact there because they're close. Um, and uh, their tool counts are more similar. Uh, uh, they deviate from the expected just from their population sizes as a consequence of that. Yeah, Tonga has an effect on Fiji, similarly. Uh, Tonga was one of the, was the next biggest after Hawaii um, had an empire, an imperial ambition, right? Um, the king of Tonga. And, uh, uh, and other cases as well. Uh, the Trobrians uh, uh, had a lots of trade as well. Um, but you're seeing it falls off with distance. We can also plot this on the, uh, so the population or log population is on the horizontal. So this lets us take a look at what's going on with the hypothesis of interest. We're interested in log population is the original reason we cared about this data set. Um, again, island societies points are proportional to their population sizes. The trend plotted here is the average prediction just from population size, right, from the posterior. So strong relationship, again, you're not surprised by this anymore with population size. Um, and then the line segments showing the same thing as before. They're the same line segments from the same correlation matrix. You can see them, uh, uh, things getting drug around as a consequence of this, right? So you can think about like Tonga there. Tonga had lots of tools. Um, it, the model thinks Fiji was drug upwards from its population expectation as a consequence of this. Okay, questions? Yeah, Brett, is this an easy one or is this gonna be a complicated question? <laughs> okay. Uh, does the beta change as a result of including the Gaussian process? Very little, no. There's, in this case, there's very little. The, the average effect uh, that elasticity doesn't change very much as a consequence. You can go ahead and take a comparison. But uh, you do get these, you estimate the covariance effect. So one way to think about this is uh, spatial autocorrelation is a threat to this hypothesis that population size matters. And this model shows that that survives that threat. 
but there is spatial autocorrelation in the data set still. Uh, but it doesn't, doesn't remove the population effect. Yeah, it's a potential backdoor. You might think of it that way. Okay. All right, uh, let me show you um, another example. And before I get into that, uh, I wanna give you this slide where I just list a bunch of stuff that you can do. If you Google Gaussian process regression, you will find huge numbers of results. This is a big deal, machine learning approach. It's used lots of areas. And sometimes it's called Bayesian non-parametric regression, which is the, the world's worst statistics phrase, right? Because obviously Bayesian models have parameters. So what, is, what does non-parametric mean? It means there's an infinite number of functions that are being considered. Uh, and that's literally true. You're used to considering an infinite number of regression lines, right? We, uh, these models consider an infinite number of splines that pass through the continuous categories, and then they select among them with regularization. And so these are very popular in big machine learning projects, and you'll find tons of um, uh, tutorials online about these things and lots of really diverse applications. And uh, so uh, there are lots of periodic data sets, like seasonality data sets uh, in ecology or social science. Uh, where uh, the, the covariance function actually has cosines inside of it to, to measure the periodicity of it, right? So every winter things happen. Human births, uh, there's this cool analysis in Gelman et al.'s Bayesian data analysis book of human births and their periodicity. And yes, human births are highly period, periodic uh, using Gaussian process regression with periodic functions. Uh, so there, that's one kind of application that goes on here. Um, Phylogenetic distances, which is the example I'm going to turn to next, are like this as well. All phylogenetic regressions are special cases of Gaussian processes with, with particular strategies for building the covariance matrix. Um, social networks are a kind of distance as well, and all kinds of splines, like that age example I showed you. Uh, so there, there's a person in my department, Cody Ross, who does child growth data sets this way using Gaussian process curves. Um, and uh, then you don't have to make any assumptions about the exact functional shape, right? Uh, you can do this with regularization. Uh, there's this other technique. You don't have to use only one distance matrix. You can use a bunch at the same time and give them and estimate weights for how important they are. I won't walk you through this thing at the bottom. Just say that if you're interested in this, it's called automatic relevance determination, another terrible machine learning term. Uh, it's, just, it's just that you're estimating the importance of each kind of distance on the covariance between the items when you do it. So you can use more than one distance matrix, right? So you could have like a genetic similarity matrix and a, and a, a spatial similarity matrix and then estimate things, uh, for example. Okay, let's turn to uh, phylogenetic regression. So uh, in evolutionary biology, it's a big deal to worry about when you do species comparisons, uh, to worry about how long ago this pairs of species diverge from one another. I think for, if you're outside of biology, this is a surprise sometimes, and it makes sense after you've heard about it, because in the social sciences, in my experience, people rarely worry about this. There's just kind of like you just compare countries and don't worry about the fact that they're next to one another or they share recent uh, cultural influences. You see this all the time in journals. And, uh, but anthropologists and evolutionary biologists have worried about these problems for a long time of, of what you might say shared history, shared common history. Why do we worry about that? Because this introduces a bunch of potential backdoors in inference. It's like a proxy for shared exposures and stuff. Some of those shared exposures are just common genes uh, <laughs> that you share because of your common history. Uh, but there are lots of other things, like the kinds of ecologies you live in and so on, that also create common exposures. And you may not have measured all those things. But phylogenetic history, time since you diverged, is a proxy for a bunch of those inferential threats. And so you'll see the biology journals are just full of phylogenetic regressions. And this is now a standard part of the comparative method. Um, and uh, uh, we're gonna use this, I'm gonna show you the most basic form of this and then show you uh, how flexible this approach can be as well. There are lots of ways in the literature that people smuggle, as it were, phylogenetic information into some kind of generalized linear model. Um, the most basic one uh, is the Brownian motion model and uh, something that is called phylogenetic generalized least squares. We're not going to use generalized least squares. We're going to use a posterior distribution, but the model form uh, will be very similar to this. Um, the Brownian motion model is, is the simplest, but also the world's goofiest evolutionary model. Uh, there is no trait that evolves this way. Uh, and I'll explain what this means as we go, but it's a, it's a place to start, right? And there was a time when it was all you could do in the computer. Uh, 
There are these other uh, processes, huge numbers of processes, like these uh, uh, ornstein ullenbeck processes, which are like Brownian motion, but they're variance constrained. Uh, the variance can't keep inflating forever. Right? The difference is that there's some attractor um, that pulls back the traits. And there's a huge number of other hypotheses. If you've got some process for how evolution works on a branch, then it implies a particular kind of covariance structure among the species. And that's what the idea is. So any particular phylogeny plus a model of how traits evolve on it implies a covariance structure. And that's how all of these regressions work. Um, so let's use this primate data set that I have showed you before in the class. Uh, so this is right, primates 301. The 301 is the number of species in the data set. I mean, there are more primates than this, but these are the ones we have data on, <laughs> okay? So um, well, there are probably twice as many lemurs that are actually on this tree, right? It's just like Madagascar is lousy with lemurs and uh, huge numbers of lemurs. Um, but uh, so primates 301, and then you can load with primates 301 underscore next, you get this tree. It's a nexus tree format. Some of you have worked with phylogenies, you know this, and you can load it in and plot it. Uh, and this is how I show you. We're going to use the ache library uh, to, to manipulate this nexus tree. It'll do things like draw this totally inscrutable phylogeny, right, <laughs> with 301 uh, primates on the tips. Um, to give you some idea what's going on here, uh, there are primatologists in the room. Uh, the apes are in the upper left there. There's that little cluster that is the apes. The apes are kind of the losers in the primates, right? They've been going extinct at rapid rates for a long time since the Miocene. Right, and then you get the old world monkeys, just to the right of them, these are the big winners. Uh, recent massive um, uh, diversification, especially the Cercopithecines, the macaques and the baboons and so on. Um, Galagos and lorises on the right hand side as you go around the clock. Um, small and, and very deeply diverged group. And uh, then the lemurs, lots of them, lots of least recent radiations, all of them on Madagascar. Then this tiny little tarsier thing on the bottom as we round uh, the half hour mark, right? There's a few tarsier species. Uh, they're very, very different from one another. Um, and then the new so-called new world monkeys. I put these things in quotes because this is the European colonialist view, right? About what new world, no world is. Sorry, this is, these are the standard terms still in anthropology until we figure out something else to say. Um, the Americas and the, and the non-Americas, right? So the new world monkeys live in Central and South America and uh, there are a lot of them as well. Um, and so uh, I know everyone's asking, like, where are we? Uh, we're in here, right? You see um, Homo sapiens right next to Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, right? Right next to the best species name, Gorilla, 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 which is the world's best species name. <laughs> right. um, so uh, I'm an anthropologist, so I think I could draw this part of the tree but, uh, from memory. Uh, but we're going to use the whole tree, and we're going to be interested in some comparative uh, questions between um, body size, brain size, and group size. So uh, the anthropologists in the audience here will know, but I, hopefully everybody else will be interested uh, in this hypothesis as well. There's this popular hypothesis in, in evolutionary anthropology that um, one of the things a large brain does for you is it makes it possible for you to live in big groups, uh, makes you cleverer. This is one of the things intelligence is for. And so you'll find lots of papers where people analyze so-called social intelligence hypothesis in various forms. It's kind of a squishy field of hypotheses. And we're interested in the association between brain size and group size. Um, and the first thing you've got to think of is that there's this back door. If we, if we have the idea that a big brain uh, influences group size because it makes it possible for you to, well, tolerate and <laughs> uh, conspecifics, right? Um, there's this back door through body size because brain size and body size are correlated, right? Because body size causes brain size. That's an uncontroversial statement, I think. If you inflate a growth factor, it makes everything bigger than an animal. Yeah. Um, and brain, body size might also have a direct causal influence on group size. Uh, how? Well, there are lots of mechanisms. Um, one of them would be it changes the kind of ecology you're in. Larger primates live in different places. In particular, they're terrestrial. Uh, and that changes a lot of things about your life, uh, which might also influence group size. Right? Like the, a lot of the circopithecines are terrestrial and they live in really big groups. Um, so what happens here now is we've got to trim the tree. Uh, there isn't um, data for some of these variables for all the primates, right? Uh, and a particular brain size, I think, is missing for lots of the smaller primates um, because we're not interested in their brains for some unfortunate reason, but we should measure their brain sizes, yeah. And so if you trim this down, I think you, you end up with 151 species that have all three of these variables measured, brain size, body size, and group size. 
and I'm going to use these variables to show you the world's simplest phylogenetic regression so that you can understand what it is. And I hope this will seem deflationary as well. This is a cool technique, but there's nothing magical about it. And there's certainly no evolution in this model. Right? It's purely treating phylogeny as some like squishy common exposure measure. Uh, it's definitely not uh, uh, super science going on here. It's useful, but it's really geocentric, just like a lot of the things we've done before. This is not an evolutionary model. It's a geocentric evolutionary model. I'm not trying to say don't do it. I'm just trying to say you don't have to do things this way. Um, so to get here, first I want to show you an ordinary linear regression, but I want to weird it. <laughs> uh, I want to express it in the world's least convenient form, because then once we've done that, all we have to do to make it a phylogenetic regression is change one line. Uh, so let me show you an ordinary linear regression in the strangest way possible. And the way to think about this is that all of the outcomes for all the species are one outcome. They're just a big vector of group sizes. And this is going to be our outcome. This is going to be log group size, actually. Uh, this is what we're going to predict. We're going to do log group size as a function of log body size and, and log brain size. And don't think of every species as being some independent thing. Think of it as being one, you sample all the tips of the tree simultaneously. And they come from one distribution, one giant multivariate normal distribution. And every linear regression can be expressed this way. You just take all of the outcomes and put them in one big vector. That's what bold G is here. It's just all the group sizes. And you, give, you, you make the, the likelihood a multivariate normal. And then there's some vector of means mu, which is the same as before. Each species has its predictor equation with its predictor values. And then there's this covariance matrix S. And in a standard linear regression, this covariance matrix S has uh, sigma squared along the diagonal and 0 everywhere else. And the way we're going to construct this, as I show in this slide, is you say S is equal to sigma squared times I, where I is this thing called an identity matrix, which I show you in the lower right of this slide. So if you multiply the scalar sigma squared into this, you get sigma squared along the diagonal, which means the residual variance expected for every species is sigma squared. Everything else is zero. There's no correlation. You're back to a linear regression. Yeah? And I know, this is like, why would you ever write it this way? And the answer is because now we're going to get to a phylogenetic regression by changing one thing, and that is S. We replace S with something that has information about the phylogeny inside of it. You get correlations on the off-diagonal, and then you have a phylogenetic regression. Okay? But this is a linear regression. This is like every linear regression you've ever done. You would never do it this way, right? But, but here you go. This is how it works. Okay. So here's how you do this in the code. Um, like I said there's just one line here. There's a matrix which has number of rows equal to the number of species, which is 151 in this case, and number of columns the same. So this is a 151 by 151 covariance matrix. No problem. We can do this. Uh, and the diagonal is sigma squared and everything else is zero. IMAT is something I pass in as data. It's the identity matrix and I pass it in as data in this case. This is just a linear regression and if we run it, what we find is there's a very strong association between brain size, that's what B capital B is, the slope for brain size, um, and uh, group size and a slightly negative relationship for body mass, which is pretty hard to interpret. You're used to this in linear regressions, right? Because it's, it's, each is conditional on the other. So after you've taken out the brain size effect, larger species are actually in smaller groups than expected. But the total causal effect of body mass is definitely to be in bigger groups, right? Because there's this back door uh, through brain size, right? Uh, so this isn't saying, this is only the direct effect. In this model, the direct effect of body mass is negative, but not the total causal effect. Bigger, bigger species live in bigger groups in the tree, for sure. You can just get that from the averaging. Uh, but if you, take, if you take brain size out of this model, you'll see that the coefficient for body mass is positive. This is the direct effect in this model of body size is negative, but not the total effect. Yeah. Um, OK, the inferential thread, of course, is this haunting phylogeny uh, on the bottom. Uh, again, we have this U, which stands for all the stuff we're scared of, right? all the unknowns. Uh, but phylogeny gives us a tool an instrument, if you will, uh, to measure these things, uh, in a sense. Even though we can't measure them directly, phylogeny is like an exposure. That means that we expect increased covariance among uh, more recently um, separated species. And so, but then you've got to go from the phylogeny to that covariance structure, and then there's lots of choices, and they all imply different evolutionary models. The simplest one is the Brownian motion model. Is the one implied by Felsenstein and Graffin's uh, original tools for this, independent contrasts and the phylogenetic regression, both assume this Brownian motion model. What does this mean? 
Uh, there's no selection and the traits just wander randomly. It's a Gaussian random walk. That's what Brownian motion is. It was named after a, a biologist, Brown, right? Uh, who looked through microscopes and saw uh, molecules jiggering around. And so this is why it's called Brownian motion. It's named after a person. And, but it means Gaussian normal distribution velocity wandering. And when this happens, then the uh, covariance between any two species declines in a linear function of the time since the, they diverged. I'll say that again. Now, under Brownian motion, the expected covariance between two species declines in a linear fashion uh, in, as, since the time they diverged. And so that's what I'm trying to show you on this graph. Um, we compute the implied covariance matrix and then plot that against the phylogenetic distance between pairs of species in this data set. This is what you get. Uh, species that are, have phylogenetic distance near zero. When you, how do you get phylogenetic distance? You trace the branch lengths. What's the total branch length between any two species? That's phylogenetic distance. Um, and then you plot it out. Species that are very close to one another, which in primates, that's a lot, because there was, you know, this, there's been a recent diversification of primates, actually, because of the monkeys. So a lot of uh, primate species are, are relatively closely related compared to the rest of the mammals. And um, that's all the points at the left top of this, of this plot, and then declining down as you go out uh, to the end. And then, you know, everything compared to tarsiers, right, is sort of on the right. I think that's what all those points are, actually, is everything compared to tarsiers. Um, sorry, only the anthropologists here know what a tarsier is. That's okay. Everybody else, Google it. <laughs> uh, they're cool. Um, so, uh, as I say, no one, no one in evolutionary biology really likes the Brownian motion model, uh, but it's easy to use, and it's a reasonable place to start. And the literature started there because... This was the thing you could do with primitive computers. Um, I was rereading the original papers this weekend to prepare this lecture, make sure I didn't say anything too wrong. And uh, in Alan Graffin's original phylogenetic regression paper, there's this note at the end about how to get the custom program he wrote to do all of this. So you had to mail him a floppy disk, and he would send you a copy, and it ran on something that I didn't even recognize uh, anymore, or some program that doesn't exist anymore. Now, of course, you just run this in R like everything else, right? But uh, this is how the things got started. It was like a hobby at Oxford for people to talk about these things. Um, so you can get the, the covariance matrix basically by inverting uh, the um, phylogenetic distance matrix. And that's really all you have to do to get it. And then once you've got that, um, we're going to make it into a correlation matrix so that we can fit the residual variance. And then we just pass it in. We replace the identity matrix with this correlation matrix, which comes from the phylogenetic distances. And that's the Brownian motion model, and that's it. Right. Um, we run this model, so the bold is the only thing that changes. There's this R matrix that's passed in now, it's a 151 by 151 correlation matrix, comes from the tree. And you run this thing, and things change a lot. Uh, brain size is nothing now. It's almost exactly on zero. Um, and uh, body size is now positive because all that back door before that was coming through brain has been knocked out and, there, and larger species do live in bigger groups than primates uh, for sure. So this phylogenetic control says that nope, uh, brain size and the correlation between brain size and group size in the data set is because closely related species have similar brains and similar body sizes uh, and it's just could easily just be a confound of phylogenetic distance. Uh, to give you an idea of what's going on, you can plot this trim tree and just <laughs> swap the tip labels out for group sizes, which is what I've done here. And I know you're not going to spend time looking at each of this, but I want you to see there's a lot of phylogenetic signal on group size in these data sets. And it's strongly associated with body size. At the bottom, we've got a bunch of prosimians, right, a bunch of lemurs, and they, they're solitaries. That's what all those ones are, right, and they're, they're closely related. You get these effects in many parts of the tree. Um, so I'm, now I'm pointing with my hand, and I don't have a pointer here, but uh, the gibbons, you see the gibbons, right? Everybody sees the gibbons in the tree. <laughs> um, sort of in the upper left, uh, like half of all the apes are gibbons, right? So <laughs> um, there are lots of gibbons and seamongs and stuff up there. They're sort of in the, you know, it's like 50 minutes to the hour. They're the, the gibbons, and they live in small groups, and there are a bunch of them, and they're closely related. So there's lots of signal on group size here. It's also associated with body size, and that's what this Brownian motion model is picking up. Um, Circopithecines as well, they live in bigger groups. Uh, they're closely related. Um, let's do one more thing uh, before I let you go. Let's, let's do the Gaussian process version of this. So the Brownian motion model is weird in the sense that it says similarity declines linearly with time since divergence. There, the only way to get that is that there's no selection. Uh, anything else, you're going to get some acceleration of the decline with distance. 
Uh, closely related species can be very similar, but then after some amount of phylogenetic distance, you don't expect any of those confounds to be shared anymore. Uh, and so you can fit a bunch of functions that way, and there are lots of different things in the literature to do that. Let's just do the Gaussian process because it'll consider a huge number of functions that have this, an infinite number in fact. And we can just estimate in this data set uh, what is the covariance function that declines with uh, phylogenetic distance. Um, and since I've already showed you the, the world's least convenient linear regression formula, again, we just have to change one line. We just take that line that computes the covariance matrix, the 151 by 151 sigma, and we just make the right-hand side back into this covariance GPL2, which you had before. And the distance matrix is the phylogenetic distance matrix that comes from the tree now. It's not from flying over the Pacific Ocean. It's from the inference about the time since divergence of these different species. And then we have eta squared and rho squared, and we're going to estimate them from the data and see what the covariance looks like as, as you fall off, right? The covariance in group sizes uh, with, with genetic distance. Um, same model as before. You run this. I show you the, the Precy output on the bottom. Um, brain size is still basically nothing. Uh, it's more uncertain now. And group size is even stronger than before. But there might be, if there's any relationship with brain size, it's negative. This is not looking good for this hypothesis. So I would say I'm, I'm not trying to take a stand on this hypothesis. There's lots of other confounds. It's the mess with this literature, actually, is that there are a million confounds. Nobody knows which direction the arrows go, right? Uh, because species don't, aren't described by DAGs. This is the problem. There's all this reciprocal causation. An organism's like a machine, right? And, and uh, there's all this stuff that's jointly engineered. Um, so it's hard to interpret these things, but, but it's important to have the example and understand uh, uh, the impact that phylogeny as, as a, a, pro, uh, a measure of confounds can have. We plot the covariance matrix uh, here, and this is definitely faster than linear. Uh, so one here is the maximum phylogenetic distance in the data set. It's just standardized. This is definitely not linear decline, right? So the evidence is that, yeah, for closely related species, there's a lot of correlation in group sizes in this data. Uh, but it declines very fast as you move away. Um, so this is a very different result. And I'm not arguing that this is the right thing to do. But I'm saying it makes a big difference, exactly what you assume about how you get covariance from the distance matrix. And there's no single right way to use a phylogeny. And I, I, I want to emphasize that because I think sometimes when you're initially taught phylogenetic regression, it's taught like there's one right way to use a phylogeny to control for confounds when you do uh, species comparisons. And that's not true. It's just like all this other varying effects stuff. It's just, just a varying effects model. And you've got some hypothesis about how uh, a shared descent creates confounds is correlated with confounds. But we don't know exactly how that works. And it's a, it's a domain for lively debate. Um, you could actually just use a big varying effects model where you use like genus and family and infra order and everything else as random effect categories and you'll get basically the same result, I think. Uh, it's kind of like a dark thing to say, but uh, there's nothing special about uh, uh, this sort of stuff. It's just a way to get an index on compounds. So um, let me try to summarize. Uh, lots of different ways you can use these covariance. You can build covariance functions from phylogenetic information. Um, one of the interesting things is uh, variable rates on branches, right? So some parts of the primate order have evolved faster than others recently, and so the covariance will decline faster in those, right? So if they just think about the apes, right? There are a bunch of apes in this room. <laughs> uh, you're really, really different from the other apes. In fact, to the extent that lots of people just drop humans from the data sets, because uh, otherwise there's too much leverage, right? Which is weird in so many ways, uh, humans. Uh, but there are other species that are weird these, these ways too, and some lineages are very conservative uh, in lots of ways, right? So the, think about the different subspecies, uh, well, the different species of gorilla are more diverged longer from one another than uh, bonobos and chimpanzees did. And they're really, really different uh, from one another in evolutionary time, right? Uh, so some parts of the same lineage um, have evolved much more slowly than others. And these ways that we've calculated the covariance matrix assumes that it, it, everything moves at the same rate across the whole tree. We know that's not true. So there's lots of work in literature to deal with those sorts of issues if you're interested. Um, a big threat that I'm, I'm fascinated by is this horrible Greek word called he hemoplasy. Uh, if you've ever studied cladistics, you know it's just full of uninterpretable Greek words, right? Just everywhere. <laughs> uh, what is hemoplasy? This is incomplete lineage sorting. Uh, you can have a single tree which describes kind of the, the gross uh, demographic history of a bunch of species, but then no trait fits the tree. Not a single trait across all the tips of the branches will actually fit that tree without conflict. 
And the reason is because species don't <laughs> split in an instant like an atom, like a, like a plutonium atom, <laughs> right? There's this long period of hybridization and they may not bifurcate. You can get this whole region where multiple species like the baboons are just kind of mating around for you know thousands of years <laughs> and genes are flowing through that. And as a consequence, within a single species at some loci, you can be more closely related to one species and in another locus to another. So this is true in humans. The anthropologists all know this. For, for a, a slight majority of your loci, you're more closely related to chimpanzees, something like 60%. Uh, and for the rest, you're more closely related to gorillas. Uh, for some very small fraction, you're more closely related to orangutans, right? like some of the blood group molecules. And that's perfectly understandable because of the way evolution works. You get incomplete lineage sorting in real speciation processes. The way we built these models assumes that doesn't happen. And so there's, this is a big thing in the phylogenetics community now is to try and deal with this because it means you can't reconstruct internal nodes correctly from a consensus tree. You've got to think about there being multiple trees and the character conflict is informative. Sorry, this has been a little sermon, but I, I get really excited about these things because there's cool problems to solve, right? And all of you I know will go forth and solve these problems, right? And I'll retire. Um, uh, yeah, and there's many equilibria as well. There's real biology here. And what we really want is a model that predicts if you engineered an organism, how do all these things trade off and mutually constrain one another? And people work on those things, real life history models. Uh, and and uh, that would produce group size not as a trait, but as an emergent outcome of all of those fundamental strategies. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I have this line on here about p-values being weird. You know I always think they're weird, but in this case they're super weird because there's no null model. There are a bunch of different phylogenetic ways to construct covariance matrices and none of them is a unique null. Uh, so think about this, right? Someone said you're doing a null hypothesis test that, that phylogeny explains the data. It's like, hang on breaks, right? What do you mean, the null model? There's no null model here. There's no unique null. This is not like two treatments in a psychology experiment and there's a clear null. There's no clear null in evolutionary biology. Um, okay, I will stop there uh, before I get any more exercise about phylogenetic regression. And when you come back on Friday, we will finish the course. Thank you. <laughs>